All right, so uh, I'm C. Brown. I'm the uh, research and extension entomologist for the state of Louisiana. So uh, my responsibilities are field crops, but I also cover pastures and forages and peanuts and pretty much everything but sweet potatoes and sugar cane. So uh, if you guys have a question, please feel free to call me. Like I said, I'm, I'm here to help y'all. Uh, I've worked a lot with army worms. A little bit with Bermuda grass stem maggot. I've done a lot more work with army worms just because they're you know, pretty much ubiquitous across the state. So and more or less everybody fights them. So, and uh, I like to make this you know, pretty informal. So if you have a question in the middle of my talk, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask, ask away. I don't want you to forget or just wait. You know, you know, feel free to interrupt me. Like I said, you know, I want you all to be able to get as much information as you can. Okay, so fall army worm versus true army worm. So, you know, we don't see a whole lot of army worm issues really in March, April. We mainly see army worm issues in wheat. And so, especially in the spring, the biggest issues that I get calls on are the true army worm, which is this guy. I actually took this picture in a field this past, you know, in 2020. This was in a wheat field that was just absolutely destroyed by true army worm. Now, if you occasionally get some army worms in your spring, spring grass, which it does happen, I've had a few calls, more than likely it's not going to be falls, it's going to be trues. And the easiest way to tell the difference is the true army worm has got two brown mottled lines on its head capsule. So if you look at them, I mean, you can see that's a good picture right there. You can see the difference. The fall army worm has an inverted Y. All fall army worms are going to have this inverted Y on their face. True army worms are going to have these two brown mottled lines. And so coloration is not the best way to distinguish these army worms because I've seen true army worms that look like fall and vice versa. But typically, fall army worms are going to be darker. They're going to be black, have alternating green stripes, or a true army worm is going to be more of a kind of a mottled brown color. And so, and we don't see true army worms outside of the spring. We rarely ever see them in the fall. I, mean, I haven't heard of any instances in the fall. And so, if you guys are going to see them, it's typically, it's going to be early spring. So, but if you're fighting something, especially in the summertime or in the fall, 99 times out of 100, it's going to be fall army worm. So, army worms in Louisiana, they're going to build populations very quickly. And I don't have to tell you guys this at all. I know, you know, y'all are very much aware of how quickly army worms will jump on you. And so, the larger the worms, the more they eat. And so, army worms eat... Or, what we call different growth stages of army worms are instars. So you have typically a first instar through a, a, a sixth. And each instar, so second instars eat more than first. Third instars eat more than all of second. And so as the worms get larger, each successive instar has eaten more than all the other instars combined. So seconds, or so thirds are going to eat more than seconds and firsts. Fifths are going to eat more than fourths, thirds, seconds, and firsts combined. So that's why when you get large populations of worms, you start taking heavy amounts of damage very quickly. And so and you, a lot of times you'll see mixed populations. I mean, this was out of a field that I took when I was, I was formerly stationed at Macon Ridge up in Winsboro. So I was up there, Macon Ridge at St. Joseph up in Tensall Parish for seven years. And then I accepted the position as a statewide entomologist, and my wife and I, uh, moved down here in 2019. So we've been working on our third year here. So uh, <clears throat> economic control methods do exist. And, you know, we have pyrethroid applications work very well. The problem with pyrethroids is they're very short residual. And then populations sometimes may control themselves. You can actually get enough army worms that you get uh, a virus or an entomopathogen moves through and just completely wipes that population out. Now, it's rare, but it can happen. And the problem is, is, by the time those populations hit that size, you've taken so much damage, it doesn't matter. I mean, the populations are going to take themselves out, but you've got to be grassy. All right, so what do army worm eggs look like? This is what they look like on a soybean leaf. That's really kind of the best contrast that I could find. They're going to deposit eggs in masses of typically 50 plus, and it's going to be fuzzy. You're going to see fuzzy egg masses. And what they're going to do is these worms are going to hatch, and they're going to eat the fuzzy egg mass. The neonates, what they do is they eat the chorion or the egg capsule after they hatch, and then they eat the egg mass. And what that does is it gives them protein, and it gives them a fats and protein so they can kind of jumpstart their life, and then they move to your grass. 
And so a lot of times what you'll see is you may find the after effects of this. You'll see cast skins and casings if you go out and really look hard in your grass. And you can see that you know, there's only ones out there and they're feeding. Um, and it's going to be deposited typically in dense growth. So the army worm, the, the female army worms are going to, they're going to, they're very opportunistic. They're going to lay eggs in more dense growth than probably more patchy growth because they have a better success for their, their larva to succeed. And so, you know, if you've got an overgrazed pasture and there's not much grass out there, army worms are probably not going to be attracted to it as much as they are in next to your very lush pasture that hasn't been grazed. And so they're going to deposit in the very lush pasture that hasn't been grazed. Okay, so this is a picture of what they look like. And so this is uh, kind of what I was talking about. This is when they, they hatch and they start to eat that egg mass and then they're ramping up their protein and carbohydrate consumption. And uh, they're very hard to identify at this stage just because they're so small. And so what you're going to see hundreds if not thousands of them. And, but as they become older, the later end stars become darker and their lines on their body actually become more distinct. I've seen fall warming worms Kind of like if you guys are, you know, the you know, corn ear worms, if you go grow corn or you grow cotton, or cotton bowl worm, you know, those, they're, they're similar insects because I've seen both of those insects, purple, pink, brown, green, black, red, I mean, pretty much every color under the sun, I've seen an, an army worm in a bowl. So, I mean, there are, that's why I say, you know, color is not a good way to distinguish on insects. And really, the best way to do it is to look at that inverted Y on our head caps. And there are very few other defoliators that you're going to experience in pastures that are as serious as an worm. I mean, you now you may get, occasionally, you'll have a salt marsh caterpillar, or maybe like a, what we call a woolly bear. It's a big fuzzy looking caterpillar. But there's, you know, you find those in singles, or you find them two or three. You're not finding 200, 300, 1,000, you know, in a field. And, you know, I was kind of joking with, with one of the hay producers. I was talking about I need to make a pant leg threshold to where you walk through a field and you count how much you're hanging off your pants and see it's like, well, I've walked about 10 yards and I have 50 hanging off my pants. I think we need to make an application. So, I mean, it's, but that's, you know, we do have thresholds and they do work very well. And so the army worm life cycle is going to take three to four days to hatch. Now, this is very much dependent on temperature and day length. All insects are dependent on temperature and day length. Especially in Louisiana, as the summer, you know, we get, as our days get longer, the temperature increases, we're going to start turning over more generations. And so that's why, you know, we can have generational turnover very quickly here with army worms in Louisiana, which makes it very hard to control because you've got overlapping generations. You've got, you know, fifth, fifth end stars with neonates. And so you've got one that's about to cycle. One generation is fixing a cycle and one right behind it that's fixing to come in and take up where that one left off. So, you know, when you're only looking at 15 to 12 to 15 days to complete maturity, you know, you can get a couple generations in a month. And so that's when you really start taking some serious damage. And uh, like I said, your layer instars eat as much as all previous instars combined. So what, they're, what the cool season temperature effects are going to do, so, you know, typically fall army worms, we see them in, it's kind of a misnomer that we see them in the fall, is I've seen them in the summer. But our falls in Louisiana are not like falls in Kansas or, you know, up in the East Coast where we actually have distinct seasons. You know, we're in November and still bumping 85 to 90 degrees some days. I mean, that's not really the fall. So, but when temperatures do start cooling off, it can slow larval development. So as the nights get cooler and the days start to get shorter, that's going to affect your larval development. And then, so as you have that slower development, that actually increases your likelihood of overlapping generations. Now, it can happen when it's hot, but you really start to see it when it starts to cool off because these guys are slowed down and they're not taking as long to generate. And then, but the thing that what does happen is adult moths will fly around and continue laying eggs. And so she's going to continue laying eggs as they warm your feet. And so that you may have, you know, like I said, you can have a couple overlapping generations that can really cause some damage. Okay, so what does the injury look like? So injury is going to often appear from the edges first. And so especially if they've exhausted all the resources in one field, they will move in mass. That's why they're called army, because they move like an army. They march like an army. And they will typically move in mass to different fields as they defoliate. And so they're going to see, typically you're going to see damage on the edges first, but that's not always the case. You can see, damages in the, see damage in the middle of the field. And like I said, where you have lush grass, 
If you've got some really thick, nice, lush pasture, you know, you may see it there first and it may be in the middle of the field. So I mean, it's just really, you know, walk in your field, getting out and looking, that's really what's going to be the key. Um, once, you're, once the resources are exhausted, our worms are going to move, and your newly established stands and wheat pastures are at most risk for severe injury. Now, they're going to prefer thick, lush stands, but they're going to eat your wheat pastures too. And so, you know, if you've just sprayed the Bermuda grass or you've got newly established grass, they can come through and wipe it out, and that can cause, I mean, that's, that's total yield loss. I mean, they'll actually kill it. And so, you know, grass is very hardy. Grass can recover very well. But if it's a wheat stand or a drought or, you know, it's a newly established pasture and you don't get them under control, you may not have a pasture. So this is your early signs of infestation. So small larvae are going to window pane leaf tissue. And so what we mean by window pane is that those neonate larvae that I showed you are not big enough to eat all of the leaf tissue. So what they do is they kind of scrape it. They'll chew through the external leaf surface and they'll eat all the contents from one side of the leaf blade, but they'll leave a window pane, kind of like you see in a church. They'll leave a window pane because they're not big enough and their, their, man, their mouth parts are not strong enough to make it all the way through that blade grass. And so it gives it a frosted appearance. And so you're going to have growing brown patches. And so whereas larger worms just eat it all, these neonates are actually going to cause that frosted appearance in the summertime. And that's not, that's actually, that's the initiation of injury starting to form. Okay, so scouting. Don't rely on birds. This is one of the biggest things that I tell growers is that you cannot rely on birds because by the time birds show up and they start feeding, it's probably too late and you've taken a big hit. Um, birds are not going to be after the neonates because, you know, you're thinking, you know, cowbirds, egrets, you know, whatever it may be, are not going to be after eating a worm that's a couple millimeters long. They're going to be eating a big, hulking, you know, inch to inch and a half long fall army worms that are going to give them the most bang for their buck. So, you know, that's when you're going to start seeing, and that's when you're seeing major damage. And so don't initiate on the birds. That's going to be the best way to look at it. Now, if you want to, I know everybody's busy, and everybody's got a lot of pasture, and if you're, you know, depending on what you've got going on, if you want to initiate scouting when birds congregate, I'm more okay with that than you are just waiting on birds. And then if you see birds congregating in an area of the field, don't let it hang out. Go look. Just go take a look. Go right over there and look. And you don't even have to really use a sweet net. I would prefer you would, but if you just walk through it and use that, you know, pants leg threshold, then you know there's worms out there and you may need to start thinking about making an application. And scout when they feed. Fall army worms feed in the morning and the evening. And so they're not insects typically prefer more temperate climates. Now they do, it's not just because we get 101 or 105 in the summertime, that's not enough to cook these insects. And so they're gonna, what they're gonna do is they're not gonna be in the top, they're gonna be down in the thatch layer. So they're gonna burrow down in the thatch where it's cool, they're gonna have shade, and they're not gonna do much. But as soon as it starts to, you know, in the morning when it's cool or at night when the sun goes down, they're gonna emerge from the thatch and start feeding. And so I've also talked to guys like to scout at night. They're gonna be out there at night potentially feeding. And so if you're out riding through your pasture and you want to really see how many army worms you've got, go out there at dusk or at night and really take a look. And then you see frass. Frass signals for feeding. You know, just like to come up with these fancy names for things. Frass is, is bug poop is basically the best way to put it. So frass is, and, and look, and you would think it would, it's going to be hard to see. It's not. When you've got a major infestation of army worms, frass is actually very easy to see uh, when it comes to the scouting. So our threshold is one worm per sweep or two worms per square foot. What I really like to, you know, what I've kind of convinced guys to do is if anybody's got any spare PVC laying around, uh, make you a square foot and just, you know, make, all you have to do is get you four elbows and a couple pieces of PVC pipe and just make you a square foot. Throw it in the back of your mule or throw it in your tractor or your truck. And if you're out running around, just take it and throw it. The best way to do it, if you want to be scientifically accurate, is turn your back and throw it over your back, so you can't, you don't bias where it goes. I'm not expecting y'all to be that, to go that far. Throw it down on the ground and go count. Just kind of, and it can be quick. Just go look and see count how many army worms you have in that PVC pipe, and then that's going to help see if you have a threshold. Scout ten random areas. So just don't throw it, don't throw it five times in the length of this table. Just pick it up. It's like okay, well I'm good. No, I mean, drive around your pasture. Take a, you know, really go scout thoroughly. 
And take samples from dense vegetation, but also take them from weak vegetation. And so you can really get a good representation of that field. Especially the larger the field, the more samples you're going to need to take. You know, if you've got a 100 acre hay field versus a 10 acre hay field, you need to take more samples and spread your samples out. And then scout at a minimum of two week intervals. What that's going to do is it'll help you catch those generations. And so, you know, ideally once a week is best, but I mean, two, twice, once every two weeks, I think it's fine as well. So if you can scout once every two weeks, I think you're going to be staying on top of it. So control methods. So there are natural control methods out in the world. Predators, pathogens, parasitoids, ground, ground beetles are one. Uh, wasps, you know, this is an example of a ground beetle. Uh, we have parasitoids. So if you see, uh, most everybody has seen armyworms or some kind of, if you have a garden that's got tomatoes, you see the tomato hornworm. If it's got fuzzy looking little white things growing out of its back, that's a parasitoid. Those are good. You want to leave them there. And then another one is pathogens. So this is actually a sick worm. This is from that same wheat field that I was at this past spring. But this is a, this is a true army worm, but fall army worm is going to exhibit the same symptomology. It's dried out. All that's left is a head capsule. That's actually, they was infected with a virus. And that virus caused that worm to crawl from the bottom of the canopy to the top and essentially liquefy and just spread that virus out. So, but that's not always reliable. A lot of times what will happen is the, the numbers in this field were just astronomical. That's why that virus moved through. And so you don't want to let those numbers get that high. If it comes in and takes out your populations early, that's fantastic. But don't let them get to that point to where you've got to rely on virus because by that time you probably you may have lost 40% of your grass. Our chemical control, large worms are harder to kill than small. That's a general rule of all bugs. Typically, the bigger the bug, the more, the more it's going to take to kill it. Be aware of your grazing and harvest restrictions. Most of your pyrethroids are going to be pretty easy. They're going to be in maybe maximum of a day before you harvest. I mean, typically for hay, I've seen seven days. For harvest or for grazing, I've seen a day. Some, you don't even have to pull the cows or the horses out of the pasture. You can just, you can lift the boom up around the cows and you may get a little bit of fly control <laughs> too. So, just depends. Just, but you got to read the label. Make sure you read the label before you do that. Um, there are generic options available. I don't have to tell you guys that. And cutter, cutter graze growing pastures, they're not going to have residue after applications. So you cut your residual out. So if you spray a hay pasture and you a week later you cut it for hay, you've taken all that residual with you. So you bailed it and pulled it off. So um, if you guys are looking for something, you know, I've had... I've had chemical dealers call me, I've had growers call me and say chemical dealers are recommended we use like a Prevathon or the Siege because they say it's going to give me 21 to 28 days of residual. Prevathon and the Siege are great insecticides. I've looked at Prevathon on pastures, I've looked at the Siege on pastures, they work phenomenally. But they cost, if you use the label right there, you're looking at $15 an acre, if at least. So, and the problem with that is, is you know, it's kind of a misnomer that they've got 21 to 30 days of residual. Yeah, they do, but in soybeans and in cotton, but in pastures, you know, soybeans and cotton don't grow as quickly as pastures do. And so that residual is growing out with your grass. So if you spray your grass when it's a foot tall and then you're two feet tall, you come in and cut it, all of that residual is gone. And so, and actually, that residual doesn't move, it moves up the plant. It doesn't, the new growth is not going to be protected. What you're going to protect is going to be what was actually sprayed. And that's kind of a, you know, and I've heard guys say, well, if it hits the soil, the roots will pick it up. That's a, that's a stretch. That's a long stretch. And I wouldn't really think that I would rely, I wouldn't bet the farm on that. So, really, the takeaway from that is, is just, you know, pyrethroids are safe, they're effective, and they're pretty cost effective, they're, they're economical. And if you want something with good residual that's proven that won't break the bank, Demolin works very well. Two ounces of Demolin I've seen hold for two weeks, if not longer. And why Demolin works so well is Demolin is a growth regulator, so what it does is it disrupts the life cycle. It interacts with their molting hormones. Actually, it's, it's a cotton synthesis inhibitor. So insects are made out of cotton. What it does is it interrupts the synthesis, causes them to prematurely or go into haywire, causing them to create more cotton, and it actually causes them to die. And so, but what's good about I, the uh, Demolin or Confirm and Trevor, any of these IGRs, Demolin is going to be the, by far the cheapest out of these three, is 
that you're going to get residual control that you'll help catch some of these other populations that may be coming in, subsequent generations coming in behind them. A pyrethroid is good for about one to three days. If you catch a rain on a pyrethroid of any substance, it's gone. I've seen pyrethroids fail after a heavy duty. So I mean, we're talking enough to where the dew rolls down the plant. It may potentially, if it's not, if it hasn't adhered to the plant surface very well, it's, it can roll down the plant. And pyrethroids are not translaminar. I've had a couple of pasture guys have somebody tell them pyrethroids are translaminar, which means it moves into the tissue. Pyrethroids are not translaminar. They sit on the surface. So that's why when a, when a bug crawls across them and, and dies, they don't have to ingest it. They just have to touch it. All right, this is our chemical control guide. If you guys, I recommend, you know, getting the, our, uh, our insecticide control guide. We put a lot of work into this. I work with, you know, other entomologists and see what, what they have, what, based on what data we've got. And so we come up with this guide, and it seems to work very well. I mean, I do have chlorantranolaprol in there. It is recommended. It does work. But there are things that are much more effective. It's not, excuse me, not effective, much more economically, you know, viable. All right, so moving on to Bermuda grass stem maggot. So this has been a problem. I've gotten more Bermuda grass stem maggot calls over the last few years than I've had in a long time. This is the adult. It looks like a little kind of reddish brown, kind of a gnat, and that's the larva. And so you're going to see them really kind of in the joint of the grass, and, and they're very, they're actually pretty hard to find. So damage potential, defined stem grasses are more susceptible. I haven't done much <clears throat> research or looked at a whole lot of Bermuda grass stem maggot, because a lot of times when people call me, it's too late. It's either been cut or, you know, they're like, oh, I had stem maggots a week ago, but we cut that baby, so we we'll so can't see it. So, um, <clears throat> if you guys think you have Bermuda grass stem maggot issues, please call me so I can come take a look at it and see, so I can get a little bit, you know, like I can get a little bit more familiar with this insect. I've seen it a handful of times, but everybody, and this is just a flight of an extension entomologist, I get called after the fact. It's like, oh yeah, we had bugs last week, but we took care of them. Sorry, don't worry. You did, but I'm just letting you know they're out here. It's like, call me before you go out and make an application, or call me before you come, hey, or I can come and take a look at it. Um, they're going to be in highly managed, well fertilized fields that are growing off well. And Georgia's experience in yield loss is a 50% or more. Georgia has had a time with this insect, so has Texas. And I don't know if it's just the number of acres of pasture that they have versus what Louisiana's got. But a lot of good work is coming out of Georgia, and there's some work coming out of Texas as well. But some of the research that was led out that was, has been produced out of Georgia has showed a decreased feed quality of hay by 7%. And so it was significant. You know, it does decrease feed quality pretty significantly. And so especially when you see yield losses of 50%, that makes a, that's, that's a hard pill to swallow. Now, the fine stem grasses, I don't know how much work has been done behind that as far as just cultivars whether one coastal or, you know, they've looked at a few of them, but that's ongoing to see how attractive some of these Bermuda grass pasture varieties are. This is what injury looks like. You have that frosted appearance. And so what happens is uh, those shoots, the larva burrows into the plant and kills that shoot. And as that shoot comes out and dies, it actually is, you know, you can see those, that new growth is dead. And then so control, planting coarse stem varieties, if you can, the Tifton 85, some of the more coarser varieties typically seem to do a little better as far as the host plant resistance. Harvest the field and remove the bales. That's a big one. If you have Bermuda grass stem maggot issues, you know, and you need to go ahead and harvest it, take the bales off. So you can get those larvae out of there. And hopefully they'll desiccate and die. Another issue is once, if you've got Bermuda grass stem maggot control and you know, what you can do, or if you've got Bermuda grass stem maggot issues, <coughs> excuse me, cut the field and then spray it five to seven days later. Because Bermuda grass stem maggot adults are actually going to be attracted to fast growing, quick uh, harvested fields. So once you cut hay and it starts to initiate new growth and you had stem maggots before you harvest it, go ahead and make an application with a low rate of a pyrethroid if. You know, if you want to be, want it to be bad enough to make an application, that's a hard pill to swallow. And a lot of guys are like, "Well, you know, can I get a two for one? If I have army worms and Bermuda grass stem maggot, yes, you'll control both. But unfortunately, you probably won't have stem maggots and army worms at the same time. And so that's just the reality of the situation. And don't let your grass hang out. 
Cut it as soon as the maturity and weather allow. So if it's time to go ahead and cut it, cut it, get it off the field and get it stored. And so what you're doing is you're helping removing, if there's insects out there, you're helping remove them from that area. So the take home message is gonna be specific to Bermuda grass. You're not gonna really see it in rye grass. You're not gonna see it in rye grass at all. Uh, if previous cutting had injury, successive cuttings probably will have more. Now you can help mitigate that by spraying it with a pyrethroid to kill the adults. That's what you're trying to do. Is you're trying to kill the adults from coming in and laying eggs. Once the egg has been laid and it's inside, the, and that larva moves inside the grass, there's nothing you can do. And so it moves, it burrows in, and you know starts. It basically stops, interrupts the flow of nutrients to the top of the plant. It's feeding on it, and it actually kills the new growth. And so you want to kill the grub, the stem maggot before the adult lays the eggs. The theory behind that is, is when that female flies around and lays on that grass and walks around, if she encounters a pyrethroid, it kills her before she can lay an egg. And so that's what you're, you're preventing her from continuing her life cycle. Uh, grace pastures aren't as, aren't as damaged as hay fields just because the cow, the cattle are actually eating the larva. They're eating, it's not going to hurt them. Uh, they're, they're keeping the grass grazed and they're not allowing the damage to really, not to say that it's not out there, but you're not seeing the damage as the cows are eating. And then you're going to want to control the flies before they lay eggs. And the populations are going to be low in the spring, but they're going to continue to build as the year goes on. And so that's why some of your fall pastures, some of your fall cuttings, or some of your late summer cuttings are, may see the worst amount of injury because those numbers are building throughout the year. Now, what this cold weather is going to do, I don't know. That's a good question. I've been asked quite a few times about remaining sink bugs, not about remaining grass stem maggots. So, uh, I would assume that it's hopefully going to kill them. Uh, I don't know really where that they overwinter. I think we overwinter and they overwinter straw and you know a few other things. I mean, a few other places, different type of fine stem grasses. So hopefully we can control them. We got a good killing freeze with that. And that's uh, so that's my cow dog. So she's uh, this is her sitting here looking at the cows. Uh, when during the pandemic, uh, having a two year old at a daycare was fun, and so uh, she helped me plant corn. She helped me plant cotton. She loved to look at cows. And then she also loved to ride horses. So, uh, and that's my cell phone number. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to call me. Um, so I'm here to help you. And this is my job. To, you know, if you have a question or a concern, please feel free to, to call us and let us know. Right. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, we're currently using Tombstone mm -hmm. for our, uh, our armor control. Uh -huh. Is there anything else you recommend over the Tombstone? Tombstone is good. Uh, tombstone, Tombstone works fine. Uh, if you want, so I don't. What I've been told by other entomologists. Now let me say, let me preface this. I don't have data to, to support this. Not in pastures, but Lambda, Sahelopin, or Karate, or Grizzly Z, but the Lambda products have always been considered more of a worm pyrethroid. Have all have seemed to do better on worms than other pyrethroids. Say like a, a Zeta, say like a Mustang, or a Zeta Cyclamethrin. But Tombstone works very well. I've had good success out of Tombstone. So if it's working for you, I would stick with it. Uh, but I mean, if you wanted to try another option, if you could get a generic Lambda or Karate, you may try that and see if it works a little better. But I think you're fine with Tombstone. Where, where, where are the uh, the viral thing that's mm -hmm. coming out? I know you've done some work for that. Where, where are you? So I don't remember I worked with pretty closely with Jason Holmes with looking at this, and then we had a meeting up in Farmville about it and uh, looking at the viral insecticide. So this was looking at so that picture of that nuclear polyhedrosis virus that I showed you. What a company Ag Biotech has done is they've taken that virus. So to be to to really simplify this down, they take disease infected worms, grind them up, mix them with a buffer, and put them in a bottle. And go on your pasture and you spray the viral inclusion bodies on the field. The worms eat the virus, the virus infects them, and it cascades across the field. It works well in soybeans. Uh, we've had good success in corn. The problem with the one in pastures is, Jason and I have looked at this for a few years and we've had a really hard time getting it to work. It's inconsistent. And so I've gone back to the company We've talked with their representatives, and it's not just me. These are you know, them all just across the Mid-South. And so we, we're all kind of in contact with them. 
They went back to the drawing board with their, their viral type, and they said they're trying to look at a different viral variant that they're going to hopefully send back to us within, I think, this year and let us take a look. And so it's got great promise. I've seen it work very well in field crops, but in pasture, I'm not confident in it enough to recommend it. I know a high recoil is going to work. I know dim one is going to work. I don't know this is going to work, and I don't want you guys to waste your money on a, on a trip and some, see something that's not going to have that fix. So the, the, the jury's still out, and so hopefully we'll get a better look at it in the next year or two, and I can actually make a recommendation. They won't, the company has told me they're not, willing, they're not willing to sell it to pasture producers. They just don't want to sell it to you guys because, you know, you guys, I mean, with most anything, they get one shot. You get one shot to make an impression. If you fail, that's it. They're not going to go back with you again. And they don't want to blow that one shot. So, and that's, you know, if you're lucky, you'll get two. Very lucky you may get three, but they want to make sure that the product that they sell you, this is what they've told me, is going to work the first time. So. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.